In this video, we're going to go over Lab Report 3, your final lab report for KH 382 Lab. So, this isn't due until December the 5th. That is a Sunday, as all of our lab reports are due. Uh, it's going to be the Sunday. Uh, here's when we'll get back from Thanksgiving, at least for you know this fall 2021. And then uh, we'll have our great exercise skills test this week, 29th through the 30th. And then right before finals week is when this is going to be due. All right, so uh, this one shouldn't be as bad as the previous lab reports that you've done. It usually is, you know, peaks at the second one and then comes back a little bit on the last part. Uh, it's worth, you know, the same amount of points, but it's not as uh, crazy or hard to do. There's not as much material that we can go over with it. So, getting started, uh, it looks very similar to what you had previously on your lab reports. Uh, so just complete this, submit it through the Lab Report 3 assignment page, which you see over here, and uh, write a paragraph overview of the laboratory, laboratory activities performed during weeks 8 through 14. So that's going to be the FMS material that, that we did. Uh, clinically graded exercise testing, VO2 max comparisons, we got some ECG interpretation with that, and then something that's uh, not quite always covered, but at least uh, you should be able to do, we're just going to look at some energy balance assessment uh, throughout the semester, because that's part of what would be assessed in a for everything up to an exercise prescription. Essentially what we're doing here is we're wrapping up mostly everything um, that's part of fitness assessment because that's what KNH 382 Lab is all about, the fitness assessment part. And then once you got the fitness assessment, when you go to 482, if you go to 482 uh, slash 582, that's where you do the exercise prescription part of this. And uh, that, that'll put all of this together. And then down below in the new things that we've added this semester are the six minute walk test and the uh, pulmonary function testing. So those are some additional tests that we've added for at least this semester and it should be used going forward. So our first stuff, uh, you know, for, first about the paragraph, uh, it's just, you know, again, five to seven sentences. Make sure you just give an overview of these things. You don't need to be super, super long. It's just five to seven sentences. Should be able to s succinctly uh, mention a paragraph overview of that stuff in about five to seven sentences. And then uh, getting into the case study stuff for FMS. FMS is the first part. I do make a note here that if any information is missing from a case study, and there's going to be some information missing, so uh, just fair warning, if uh, any information is missing in, in uh, particular to a question or anything like that in here, to one of these, one, two, or three, or four, uh, make sure that you just state no information was re reported for that question, and then move on. Just make sure you do state it, though. Just don't leave it blank. Make sure you just state no information was reported, and move on from there. Uh, it's the same thing if you're filling out any so sort of evaluation. It also carries it forward for other people that may read this at any point. Oh, hey, uh, okay, nothing was reported. Uh, this person, they read it and they found nothing. So that's kind of what you're doing. You're reporting this to me so or to your instructor. So make sure that you do this because otherwise the instructor doesn't know if you actually know that there's nothing that was stated or anything like that. Okay, so the first part is going to be your individual FMS data. So uh, prepare a table of your FMS data, which more or less we already did because that's how we collected this data and examine and explain the results for each individual screening procedure. Was there anything, you know, off? Was there anything that, you know, was interesting potentially? Um, and then describe any previous, and these could be acute or, and or chronic injuries and past or present issues involved that were past or present issues involving mobility, stability, and or motor control. And if you don't have anything currently or past, you just state, I have no previous acute uh, or and or chronic injuries or past present injuries or issues involving this stuff and, you know, move on. Okay, so how does your data compare with the normative FMS data? And I make a note here about document and lab report three canvas 
uh, page. So let's go to that page right now. It's over here on our right. So we have normative values for the FMS. Make sure you just download this. It's a, and I also make a note here, looking for a cutoff in which risk of injury increases below this threshold. So just make sure you look for that. Uh, again, we want you to be able to you know, kind of read these sort of papers a little bit some way to dissect some of the information. This is, that's just essentially what you're looking for. Okay. And then develop and provide a rationale for an appropriate corrective exercise routine based on this patient's data. So some, some information about this is in the FMS module on the lab canvas site. So I'll, I'll just provide a little bit. Um, for anything that you got basically a two or one on, you should be able to state a couple corrective exercises for each. Some will have some crossover. Mind you, depends on what corrective exercise or uh, exercise is trying to accomplish. Um, but sort of the minimum stuff that you need to mention for it are, you know, why why this one in particular? What is it supposed to help? Or what will it help you on? Not just, you know, perform better on this thing, but what specifically is it going to help the muscles, the mobility of certain um, tissues, anything like that. And then you need to state how many reps, how many sets, how many days per week, and for how long are you going to do these corrective exercises until reevaluation. So make sure you do those four things. It follows the fit, so, you know, sort of the fit VP principle fit frequency intensity time type and then volume and progression follows sort of that uh progression although there's not super specific stuff about this but you can't just say oh i'll just do these and that's that you need to provide some level of actual uh amount that you'll do and for how long how many sets how many reps per day uh and and for how long you'll do it until reevaluation. Okay, then we come to the FMS case study one and number two. So, same thing, just follow these on through. Same thing for number two, follow these on through. And the FMS case studies, case study one and case study two. There you go. Not much more for me to say about that because it's just, again, the exact same questions, only they're to those particular people, these case studies, as it were. And you've been doing case studies in KNH 3D2 lecture, so there's not too much I have to really go over for that, or shouldn't need to. Okay, now we go to the clinically oriented graded exercise testing part. So copy and paste your table from weeks 11 through 14 data recording form into this document. That's just your uh, data with the VO2, heart rate from the ECG, the RER, VE, and VO2, and also the angina and uh, RPE scale on end blood pressure. So just copy and paste that on in here if you want to. And it'd be you know nice because it shortens the document a little bit. Just you can delete the extra columns you know between. Uh, maximum and wherever you stop the test, you know, the, the ones that are basically blank, you can delete those. You're more than welcome to. It just shortens the document, it looks nicer. It's not anything you get points taken off for though, just so you know, but it, it does look nicer. Okay, and then, to, then you'll complete this CRF table below, which you can see here. So this table looks very, very similar to what you had for lab report two, and it actually is. Uh, so what I'd do, for you, if I were you, is the VO2 max stuff from the milliliters per kilogram body weight per minute and whatnot. I would copy all of this stuff in. Don't copy the percent differences in. The main reason being uh, now our reference is going to be the Bruce treadmill test, test from our measured VO2 max. So there's no point in copying that stuff in. But definitely copy in the classification, VO2 max, uh, for milliliters per kilogram of body weight per minute, and also the VO2 max for liters per minute. Just saves you some, you know, transference time. And then you will have to fill out, you know, these few cells and then the 
percent differences you'll just have to recalculate using again that uh, previous thing that you've used before easy peasy and then describe any procedural technical physiological and or other sources of error during the CRF test that would affect CRF estimate or measurement so these could be you know things like fatigue could be um, did you have any sort of uh, physiological problems before going into the test that wouldn't preclude you from not doing it but would maybe hinder your ability to perform it did we have any sort of procedural or technical problems in administration that would affect you know getting good heart rates or did we get bad vo2 data in you know i don't think any of us got at least bad vo2 data all that looked pretty good the heart rates there was a few here and there that were a little uh janky at especially max because there is a lot of movement of the uh of the shirts usually of usually someone's shirt against the electrodes which causes a little bit of noise what looks like noise and it kind of looks like some weird drifting going on but it's it's nothing wrong it's just you know that's what the data is it doesn't mean there's anything wrong with you it's just how uh electrodes travel while on the on the skin with other things coming into contact with it it's a hard thing to avoid uh but still and then, if you remember in your previous lab report, you should probably pull it up again for part B because you're going to be like, oh, hey, was I correct in my previous lab for which the submaximal test that you thought was most accurate? And just provide a pretty thorough rationale for why not. Again, make sure you answer it with you know, several sentences about this. Put some thought into it. I'm, I'm wanting at least several sentences mainly because one this is a junior level class so i expect you to be able to put some thought into this stuff this is all about you know thinking about this stuff in terms of what the question is asking uh, i'm not looking for one word answers or anything like that all right state the reason for termination of the test for most of you as we said before this is probably going to be the uh uh, fatigue local muscle fatigue usually of the legs um, if you did have any other issues you know just make sure you state them as well um, and then using your data explain whether or not you reached v maximal vo2 with regards to the five criterion that constitute a quote-unquote good test um, now if you remember we can only use four of them because we didn't measure the fifth one the one uh, being blood lactate um, these five criterion are in the uh, last slide of the Bruce, uh, of, sorry, of the uh, ECG graded exercise testing PowerPoint. So make sure you just you, you know reference that while you're going through. And then we have a Bruce treadmill test time estimation document and that's right here. So just download this document. There's a uh, one specific for men, one specific for women, and uh, just make sure you use the correct one, plug in the time appropriately, and report that VO2 max. You know, and then how accurate was it in relation to your measured VO2 max? Explain why or why not it may not be accurate. Some some reasons could be, uh, you know, it's it's close. That's great, awesome. Uh, other times it's not. Sometimes. Um, you know, like when you start first start in a the next VO2 uh, level, it'll put you up at that level based on your time. Uh, sorry, your measured VO2 will be a little bit higher than what uh, the actual test time may think you're at. You, you know, these things. Uh, it's mainly because the tri Bruce treadmill test time, it's a linear equation, linear regression. Um, it's but based off of other people performing this test. Uh, so your VO2 may get higher or get to that level that it needs to faster than other people's, or it may be slower, or it may fit as the equation thinks it's going to fit. So 
lots of factors play in. There can be some other things as well, but I'll leave that to your uh, thoughts and interpretations. Okay, then we come to the ECG interpretation part. Now this, this looks like a lot. Uh, don't get overwhelmed. I Please don't get overwhelmed. Uh, mainly, what we'll do is you know, interpret your ECG at the following time points during your graded exercise test. So pre-exercise rest, end of each ex exercise stage, you know, just report, you know, what's going on with the ECG itself. Is there anything wrong? Does it look like normal rhythm? Things like that. Do you see anything abnormal? If you do, I would highly suggest, you know, you know mention it. And then I would suggest taking like a picture of it and pointing it out, that sort of thing. Um, heart rate from ECG compared with the recorded value. You know, this is the box counting method or anything like that. Uh, so you'll do this part. And then were you in normal sinus rhythm? What's the P wave morphology of that? PRI, QRS morphology, QRSI normal, things like this. ST segment. No one should be having ST segment depression. Uh, we would have uh, probably canceled some tests if that were happening, and especially if there's elevation. Um, again, if we saw these things, we're not. We wouldn't have people doing these that would have these sort of reactions. Um, T wave morphology. There can be some interesting things with the T wave. Um, pre exercise, we'll tend to see some people's just some every now and then. We'll have inverted T wave here or there, and inverted from what it's normally supposed to be. Um, one of the way one of the leads is always supposed to be inverted, but I've seen it in one person when I've been testing, not someone from this semester, but from a previous semester where they actually had every single T wave inverted, and uh, yeah, it stayed like that throughout the entire test. Uh, it's kind of interesting. We knew a little bit about that person, but I'm not going to mention it here, but it is this, you know, something that was interesting. For most people, though, at rest they'll have, some people may have a couple leads, inverted T wave, and then when they start exercise, it goes away, it flips back to normal. And then, you know, in recovery, we would also make note of, does it return to inversion, inverted T wave, or anything like that? Do do you have any ischemia, injury, infarction, or abnormalities? Again, probably not, shouldn't. We wouldn't have tested you. Um, are there any atrial, uh, supraventricular, junctional, or ventricular rhythm disturbances, PVCs, the like, uh, conduction disturbances, AV node, or intraventricular node, anything like that? And then what's your overall interpretation of ECGs? determine if your GXT was positive. Positive meaning you had, you know, had damage to it or negative in, to, to your heart or negative you did not have anything, you know, wrong with it. Again, it seems like a lot, but again, we're just making you, you know, take a look at your ECGs, be able to understand what's going on, that sort of thing. Okay. Going into energy balance. So what we'll have you do is record a caloric intake for at least three to five days during the week, and then one to two weekend days. And these don't have to be all at once. You know, you can spread it out. Uh, if you're starting to do this, you know, now, uh, now as in this week, uh, the week of Thanksgiving, I highly suggest don't do it on Thanksgiving because that's going to be a period where you're it's not a typical sort of day for most people. If it is a typical day for you, by all means use it. Uh, but if you're, you know, feasting and eating a whole bunch extra than you normally are, you know, don't don't include it because we want what's a typical sort of time for you or typical amount for you to eat each day. And what you week on the weekdays is sometimes different than the weekends. And so that's why we try to include it, you know, at least one weekend day, three weekdays, so minimum four days total. And if you can, include all seven. 
and just record the amount of calories consumed. I don't need all the macronutrients in there, just the total calories consumed on each of those days. And we leave you, you know, a table to do that. Then at the end, you'll sum the calories, the sigma here, sum calories from above, and then divide it by the number of days recorded, and then multiply by seven. This is just giving us the the calories, kcals per week. And if you recorded for seven days, you're just dividing by seven, multiplying by seven, so it's the same same thing. Um, okay, then we'll have you estimate your RMR. And so just use the appropriate equation using your weight, height, age, and so on. And then multiply that number from this by seven. This is getting everything in, again, kcals per week. And then estimate your unstructured energy expenditure through your IPAC data from the previous lab report. If you really want to, you can fill it out again, especially if that has changed. Uh, but we're just mentioning it. If you want, if you have it from your previous lab report, you can use that. If you want to fill out another one, you're more than welcome to do that. And again, this is going to be unstructured energy expenditure in kcals per week. And we have this document, uh, sorry, right here. How can I use METS to quantify amount of, of aerobic ac activity? And I just make note basically using the boxes on the last page. And then explain a few specific exercises that you can perform to increase your unstructured energy expenditure. You know, just a couple of them, you know, please make sure it's a few at least. And then finally, for energy intake, given your caloric intake, RMR, and unstructured energy expenditure, solve for what we're, I'm going to call X. It doesn't have a defined thing in like your ACSM manual or anything like that. Uh, but this is, this is to determine whether you are calorically positive, neutral, or in a deficit. So this is what it's going to look like. Intake equals this value of X plus RMR plus unstructured energy expenditure. And this is going to be your weekly caloric balance. So X will determine whether you're in balance or, or not. So what you'll do is you'll rewrite this essentially to look like intake minus RMR minus UEE equals X. And so intake, this is how much you're taking in. And these values are how much you're expending. And that'll just, you know, at least at the bare minimum, tell us whether you're in a caloric positive or a caloric deficit or neutral, or at least, you know, close to neutral as we can measure. And uh, we used to use this for determining exercise prescriptions because we'd have students do that. Um, that'll give us, you know, an, an idea of are you going to be losing weight? Are you going to be gaining weight? Are you going to be maintaining your weight before assigning anyone an exercise prescription? Because any exercise prescription is going to be additional kcals expended. All right, then we come to the six minute walk test and pulmonary function testing. This is, you know, fairly short, much shorter than what we had before. Okay. So for the six minute walk test results and interpretation, copy and paste your completed six minute walk test tables. These are the tables you enter data into, into this document. And then compare and contrast the results from your six minute walk test to the other test of CRF. So these were you know, the ones above. So compare them. completed in the lab report and the CRF normative ta data table in chapter three. And then copy and paste, sorry, sorry, moving on for, to the pulmonary function test results and interpretation, copy and paste both subjects pulmonary function data tables into this document. Easy peasy, easy enough to do. And then how did subjects measured pulmonary function test measurements compare to their predicted values? And what are a few reasons that they could be higher or lower than predicted? These could be with the 
you know, the person themselves could be over predicting based on their body size or anything like that. Or it could be that with the way they perform the test, maybe they didn't fit the testing methodology beforehand. Um, some of the, because we didn't, we may have not followed everything to the letter. Um, but again, these, this, that's for you to potentially surmise, you know, why things may be higher or lower than predicted. All right. So not too much more to go on here, but uh, again, if you have any questions, please contact your lab instructor. And again, this is going to be due on December 5th, at least for fall 2021, the week, right, the Sunday right before finals week.